Thanks very much for the invitation to come and speak because it made me sit down and think through um, my experience. In first year, I've, I've been convening our large first year English courses, I realised with a sinking heart for two decades uh, as I was, I was making these notes. <coughs> and one of the things that I want to talk about is the ways that, from my perspective, student literacy has changed across, across that period. Um, I feel in English we're well poised to, um, to see the shifts and changes as they happen. And uh, I'm also a member of uh, the interim executive of a new peak national body of heads of university English. Um, it's just in the process of being formed at the moment. And we had our first inaugural, we had our first meeting um, at the end of last year. And the shifts in student literacy were one of the topics that came up as a, an area of great concern. So this is university English professors across the country. So you're absolutely right. Um, <coughs> and we're more worried about it, I think, than, than most. Um, so I'm thinking about the ways that first year cohort has, has changed. And to repeat, reinforce what so many people have said already today, simply put, these students read less than students did 20 years ago. And I can say it's not just engineering students, it's English students who are not reading at all. And I'll, I'll talk about my evidence, anecdotal, but my evidence for that. Um, so <coughs> the, the Reading Resilience Toolkit, the Reading Resilience Material, um, we've also found really, really uh, useful. I think, it's, I think it's groundbreaking material and I think its impact will be um, felt across many other disciplines. Much of the reading that my students did at high school is not what, it's not the canonical literary reading that we did, all of us, I suspect, um, whether we went on to become English academics or not. Much of it is um, accessible young adult fiction. That's the level that they used to reading at, even in Year 12 English. They will have studied some canonical literature. Almost all of them will have encountered Shakespeare. But even students who did really well, that we're talking band five, band six students, they may not have read a Shakespeare play necessarily. Um, so, you know, the, this, this is a big, a big change. More importantly, I think, they're accustomed to having their own personal or niche reading practices valued, accommodated, um, in the classroom. Now, I, at one level, that's a fantastic thing. I think it's wonderful that what the students want to read, what they're passionate about, what they're interested in, is brought into the classrooms and used as the basis for, for teaching both at school and, and university. But it is, in many cases, the driving aspect of their, of their literacy, that they're used to being able to make a pronouncement, I like this, I don't like this, as if that's the beginning and the end of the matter. Um, so that's, that's kind of strange. They like what they're doing. They're very happy with their, with their literacy. They're very happy, generally, with their, with their reading practices. Now, some people have mentioned, and we hear this a lot, um, the point that literacy is, has shifted and that their visual literacy is now superior, um, certainly to ours, and I think in many ways it is, but not always. Um, I think I teach cinema as well. I teach quite a bit of film. They are, if anything, less tolerant of old film, old cinema, than they are of canonical literature. They won't watch silent movies, they won't watch black and white, and pretty much anything pre about 1994, they're not interested. It's, it's Baz Luhrmann and Romeo plus Juliet, that kind of, that editing shift that happened, and anything else is, is agonisingly slow for much of students over the last decade or so. So they see that as an indication, a demonstration of greater sophistication which in some senses it is, but not, that's not the whole story. So here's another big shift, I think. Where these students see complexity and sophistication is not the same. The, the complexity and sophistication that they value in their own lives, and I don't want to take that away from them, it's not the same as, as what we're wanting from them. So how do we um, think about ways of, of bringing those two fields together. The other issue that I haven't really thought about in any depth because I'm not interested in gaming, um, but I think we do need to think about gaming as one of the most distinctive, important social cultural practices that is happening around us and to think about the ways that that's changing their perception of media, 
um, from our perspective in English, their sense of narrative, their sense of time, um, their sense of progression and their sense of achievement. All those things are really different in the gaming environment from a novel or TV or, or other kinds of media. Um, so it's not just that they, they don't concentrate as well or whatever. They have different expectations and different understandings of <coughs> how you interact with things, with, with media. Okay, speaking distinctively about the students that we get in English at Kensington, there is a significant range of abilities. We draw them from a, a large number of different cohorts. We have students there to do a BA, a straight BA, but many of the ones who come to English are there doing BA in media, so they're already kind of less um, tolerant of traditional media like books um, than, <coughs> than of gaming, say. There is a significant subgroup doing BA, B Ed, um, or Bachelor of Education, and they have quite a low ATAR, many of them. Um, there's also another distinctive group who have quite a high ATAR who are at UNSW to do arts law or arts medicine or arts and advanced science. And they're fantastic students, but you know, we only get some of them that, that stick with us in English. I'm, I'm happy to say we do kind of um, recruit them. Uh, you know, drag them across. Uh, so our top students are as good as they ever were, but the bottom band is expanding, and I, I suspect that's true across the country. Um, and that bottom band, the lower abilities, lower experience, that's really expanded, and they have, many of them, quite significant problems in reading and writing. But I will say, a lot of those really high-achieving students don't necessarily read and are not necessarily at home with, with um, the kind of analysis that we want to do with them. Okay, the other thing I want to put on the table is to think about uh, the fact that many, most of our first year students were doing year 12, some version of year 12 a year ago. And it makes sense to bear in mind what's involved in that year 12 exam. And for us, Kensington, it's mainly the New South Wales HSC, which is a particularly intense um, year, but I think there's versions of it going on around the country. So <clears throat> that year 12 experience has a real effect on how they approach their studies at first year university and on what they come to us being able to do. In the case of English, there is, and I uh, think this has been reinforced by conversations with my colleagues on this new interim um, peak English body, there is a real division between within our discipline from secondary to tertiary study. Um, I can't think of a tertiary teacher of English who would say, yes, I recognise what's being done in schools across the country as my discipline. Okay? It's, it's that different. Here's some examples. Um, and, and I'll just put on the table, I'm not saying this from a traditionalist viewpoint. I did my PhD in post-colonial literature. I've been teaching critical theory for 30 years. I work in cultural studies. I'm absolutely open to non-canonical literary teaching. Okay, so that's my starting point. What they've done in secondary English at school is not literary. As I said, they're mainly reading young adult fiction. There really isn't a whole lot of push to get them to love reading and engage with it at, at, a, at an affective way. For instance, here's a, here's a sentence from one of my first year essays a couple, four or five years ago on Charles Dickens. A student wrote, Dickens makes effective use of descriptive language. Okay. When I show that sentence, I write it up on the whiteboard, first year tutorials, Dickens makes effective use of descriptive language, they can't see a problem with it. They say, I don't know what's wrong with that. Okay. So we talk about effective communication and literature and you know, think about the, the difference there. We talk about descriptive language and a novel and I ask them what, what else might a novel use if not at least some descriptive. Okay. So <laughs> there's some gen I mean there's some generalist things that need to be done. Obviously broad based literacy has is something that has to be covered in the secondary curriculum. But what we're losing is the capacity to, to speak very specifically about particular kinds of texts. Much of the vocabulary that's used in the school curriculum is really different. Um, our students are taught in New South Wales not to say author and reader, they're taught to say composer and responder. Because we're all authors, we're all writing text and we're all responding. And, and I think there's a strange and, and you know, misplaced 
uh, concern around the death of the author, you know, which is, which is not what Roland Barthes was writing about. There are a whole lot of other words that are used strangely. Deconstruction, when they mean analyse, um, is, is a personal favourite. Here's, here's another one, and I'm not, I mean, these are anecdotal, but, you know, I, I find them really quite worrying. Last year, we're doing the novel, and I'll talk about the back to basics stuff we're doing in our course design. So we're, we're doing introduction to the novel. I wrote the word verisimilitude up on the board. That's well known to anyone in the field of English. It means, you know, the, the creation of an appearance of reality, um, the practice of realism on the board. And a student said, oh, we did that last year. We did verisimilitude. I said, fantastic. What novel was it? And she said, it wasn't a novel. It was Hamlet. We were talking about Hamlet's verisimilitude being true to himself. I know. Okay, now this is a student who got band six in the HSC with an essay about Hamlet's verisimilitude. Her teacher was a senior HSC marker, okay. That's not a one-off kind of example. There's that level of confusion about the basic terminology that is used in the discipline. Alongside that, there's another shift where in the HSC in New South Wales, and I I'm sure there's versions of it that are true in other states. Particularly really good students have been pushed to read swathes and swathes of secondary critical material, stuff that's way beyond their capacity. My daughter last year was told to read Zizek for an essay on, that she was writing on Hitchcock. I mean, you know, Zizek is post-grade work. You know, it's extremely hard psychoanalytic theory. Um, so they're being pushed to engage with material that is way more than they need and way beyond their capacities. They're used to finding their way in a slew of stuff that is, is not basic and is not um, appropriate for their level. Um, <clears throat> and I put this next to the kind of cramming that they need to do to get through. It's an enormous amount of material that they have to get through in, in all subject areas in the HSC. It's a traumatic year for many of them. And what a lot of them do, as we know, is memorise essays. And they, that's where they've learnt their writing, <laughs> okay, memorising essays for the HSC. In one advanced English exam, to our exam, they write on eight different literary texts. Now, I, I, I couldn't write on eight different texts in, an, uh, you know, in two hours. It's, you know, I've been doing this all my life. I, I can't see how you would get through those exams without having prepared a, an essay and you know, modified it and regurgitated it. This has a real effect for us when they come to write essays for us. They've been pushed way beyond their abilities and way beyond what's needed in a way that stops being authentic and it stops making sense to many of them. Further problem, and this is for, again for the very good students who've been doing, might have been doing extension English courses, they've been pushed to write in a sophisticated way because one of the outcomes for band five and band six in English is to use sophisticated language, to use advanced vocabulary and complex sentence structures. So I've had students who are clearly smart, they're engaged, they're working really hard, they're doing their reading, they talk articulately in class, and then the essay comes in, I can't understand a word of it. It's just garbage. That, and, and they've said, oh, well, you know, we've been taught to, to write the most complex sentences we can come up with. Okay, so um, that's, that's a real problem, you know, that's, and, and it's part of they need to get a band six to do whatever they want to do. So, you know, but this cuts them off from their own experience of reading the text, from any kind of authenticity, any kind of personal response to literature or any other kind of reading that they might be doing. Okay, now I've got a, um, a, a list of points that are not specifically about the HSC and the, and the baggage that they bring with them, uh, things that I think affect their engagement with us in first year. Um, how am I going for time? I'm fine? Okay, I'll just keep going. Um, many of these, of course, you'll all be aware of, but I think they have a direct bearing on, on the first year experience. Their sense of social and public space is really different from ours. They don't often see the point of coming to lectures and face-to-face -face interactions in tutorials. Um, they don't necessarily grasp the protocols. I'm sure we've all had emails at the begin, you know, hey Brigida from you know, dude at hotmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> those, those kind of things. And, and 
these interactions have led me to think, I think we have to really start valuing the face-to-face -face part of our teaching. Um, teaching them the protocols of sitting in a lecture, of taking your turn in a tutorial, of being courteous to people in tutorials, being courteous to your lecturers um, in, in written and, and oral communication. Um, I have a, my colleague who runs the other big first year course has actually written this into uh, his learning outcomes for the course where he says, by the end of this course, you will be able to sit still for an hour <laughs> and concentrate on the material being delivered to you in a lecture. Okay? And if we're thinking about what are some practical things that we might do, and I'm basing this on the reading resilience model, I think it's about writing them into our course design thinking about the larger kind of issues that are um, inhibiting their, uh, their ability to actually engage in an in-depth way with the material that we're presenting. Okay, so their sense of social and public space, including that of the university, is really different. Also, of course, they experience and consume media very differently um, from the way students did 20 years ago. The rise in plagiarism from online sources in recent years is more, I think, or is less a consequence of a decrease in ethical standards. I'm sure that's not true in any, any substantial way, but rather that they spend so much of their lives accessing information online. There is a seamlessness about the interface with that material um, that is, I think, quite new, and it was interesting to hear about the ways that the brain's changing in, in response to a lot of this material, because I think they experience it in a way so there, there isn't really much of a break between me and me and it, and the cutting and pasting and then reworking is, uh, is part of that. It's all text on a screen, and it's there to be posted and reposted the way that they do on Facebook or, or Twitter. And they do it with such facility and, and cleverness. I mean, they're, they're fantastic at it. But within this terrain, the idea of intellectual property, respect for scholarship, those, those kind of issues are less clear and they're less self-evident. So we have to build in ways for them to learn those skills and, and to learn that kind of respect. Their understanding of what research is, is also vastly different. They will have had all kinds of information gathering activities referred to as research. So researching for an essay is like going on the web and researching a new dress or, you know, I mean, it is a commodity, it is about looking for, for these kinds of things. They've been told, we know they've been told all the way through their school years, don't use Wikipedia, um, but there's plenty of other online sites that they default to. Um, so I've got two, two examples here, uh, my favourite, personal favourite here. A few years ago, first year student wrote um, in... <coughs> One of those essay questions of do you agree or disagree with this proposition? Uh, and her first line of her essay was, this is a really disagreeable comment. So, mark the essay, etc. <laughs> and when I go back to her, I said, Demi, look, the word disagreeable doesn't actually mean that you can disagree with it. It's a, it's a funny old fashioned word, you know, 19th century, and it's the opposite of agreeable. And when I explained it to her, she said, oh, that's what the dictionary said, but I thought it must be wrong. <laughs> So I said, do you, do you know how they make a dictionary? You know, so, so now I, I tell my first year students that story. I, I tell them what a dictionary is, how one is made. I tell them this is, this is what peer-reviewed peer research is. Peer-reviewed scholarship happens this way. That's why you use it. Right? You know, and we have research exercises all the way through you know, first year, second year, third year, making them um, you know, actually foregrounding that because for many of them, not all of them, but for many of them, they don't actually get that information isn't just information. Another one, um, I was teaching Patrick White a couple of weeks ago in a, in a second year course, and uh, they had done their research assignment where they had to go onto a scholarly database and select some articles and review them and so on. At the beginning of semester, I'd introduced Patrick White to them in, in lectures, I'd read from the Nobel citation, I'd talked about critical material on Patrick White. And then when we were sitting in the classroom talking about Patrick White in a very general introductory way, and one of them said, yeah, I, look, I didn't much like it. Uh, I didn't much like the way he wrote, but so I, I went and looked at some blogs because I wanted to see what was out there. I wanted to see what people thought. Okay, so 
and, and she found on the blogs that a lot of people thought Patrick White was actually pretty good, so she was going to give him the benefit of the doubt. So having been given access to scholarly material, people who have devoted their life to researching the work of Patrick Wright, writing about it, or indeed the Nobel Prize for Literature citation on Patrick White, those things don't carry authority, but peers' comments on blogs do. And even despite all that scaffolding, all the context of this is a university classroom and a conversation, so this is a student, not, not a stupid student by any means, who thought that was an absolutely fine way to, to begin the conversation. And it kind of is. I mean, that's, that's what I've got to work with. But um, that's uh, another example of their understanding of what research is and what scholarship is and what information is. OK. OK, I know I've got another, another anecdote. To illustrate the, my point that personal opinion is valued over scholarship, I think this can be quite useful to us in the face-to-face -face classroom and, and, and on the blogs and so on. That, that. But, so here's another one. Um, this was last week, another of these introductory discussions about Patrick White. Another student said that she didn't really like his writing and that this surprised her. Uh, she was quite surprised when I didn't like it because I write and uh, I write like Patrick White. I write like this. And yeah, well, nobody, nobody in the classroom laughed because for them, they, they are writers. English students are writers before they are readers. And there's no, there's no disjunction, there's no kind of confusion around saying, I write like Patrick White, I like my writing, I don't like Patrick White's writing. That's, you know, so, so that sense of um, hierarchies of, you know, t the burden of talent is, is kind of there, you know, of course. And, uh, and with apologies to science fiction readers in the class, another student in that class said, look, I, I just like science fiction and science fantasy and Patrick White doesn't fit, you know, I'm, so I'm not interested <coughs> in reading that. So if it's demanding, if it's outside my comfort zone of my own niche reading, I don't need to, I don't need to bother. Okay, so we know that they're not readers. Um, they tell us this and they have demonstrated in, in many ways. And one of the things I want to um, bring into my experience, the, the experience of students I'm teaching in first year in particular, but to continue it all the way through, is to convey to them something of that profound pleasure that I have as a lifelong reader of novels, and watcher of movies and so on, that profound individual pleasure that is there as the basis for all the, all the writing, all the thinking that I do um, you know, in, in the life where you know, I've been blessed to, to teach uh, literature all my adult life. Um, so what a, I, I've decided that this is something we need to teach them. We need to teach them that there are certain kinds of um, pleasure that we can value um, that take a certain kind of labour. Um, so it was great, with great pleasure that I, when I met Roseanne Kennedy, I heard about the, uh, the Reading Resilience uh, Toolkit and the program because it absolutely gives us some, some really coherent, really usable tools for inculcating something of that pleasure that is based on the labour, a particular kind of labour, the labour of, of reading. I happened on some of these myself um, many years ago, five or six years ago. I set Oliver Twist as, a, as reading, compulsory reading on a first year course I was teaching called Imagining the City. I thought, you can't teach the city in English literature without Dickens and Oliver Twist, well, why not? Pretty much no one read it the first year I set it, and it was the thing that they all complained about, the thing that they, you know, in the, in the evaluations at the end, Look, everything was great, but Oliver Twist was a dog, and I'm, you know, I'm not, not going to have anything to do. Terrible. So I thought, okay, I'll, uh, I'll try and value Oliver Twist in a particular way. So I made it compulsory the following year. <laughs> <laughs> Gave them a, an essay or a test or something on it. And what I did was thought, okay, if they're going to have it read by week whatever, they need to start at the beginning of the semester and read 100 pages a week. You know, so they've got other reading, they've got some poetry. We'll start off with lots of small things so that they're, they're doing some exercise and other things. But I've just got a little reading log and so I'm saying by the end of week one, you should have read up to page 106. You should have read to the end of chapter 14 or whatever. And each week in class, I would say, so how are you going with Oliver Twist? 
are you up to the bit yet where? And sl slowly, they all read off a twist and loved it and came back to me in, in the evaluation theme, why weren't we reading this in high school? This would have been fantastic. We, would, we love the challenge of it. Okay, so I had really definite information here that, that they actually want to be pushed in that way. They want those challenges, they want, but they want to learn how to do it. Um, so I've built this um, discussion about your reading, the course reading, and also other reading into our tutorials. Now, at one level, I find that deeply frustrating because I actually want to sit down and talk about the tropes and figures. I want to talk about the narrative structure. I want to get onto the complex discussions of literary text, but they're not there yet. They're not ready for that. What they need is actually to have their reading valued and, and structured. So I begin every first year tutorial with, we go around the room, student by student. What do you love reading? What did you hate? when you did English at school. And you know there are conversations that will start between them. I had one group one year that bonded deeply over their love of the Goosebumps series of you know, kids' books and kept meeting all year you know, to, to share their love of Goosebumps. Now, that wasn't quite what I had in mind. But it is, again, also valuing um, the face-to-face -face experience. It gives them a reason to come to tutorials and, and, and share um, those experiences. And I also... When I find one of those students who's read the book ahead of time or who loves reading, and every year there's one or two of them, I get them to talk to the class about what, what they find um, helpful. Or what, I say, well, what advice would you give the others? And one of them from a couple of years ago is, is still my favourite, and I, I quote this student uh, regularly. And he said, because it, it blew me away and it blew the students away for completely different reasons, he said, well, when you're reading a really long novel, you're not going to get anywhere with it if you're reading it for less than an hour at a time. Okay, you've got to get critical mass, you've got to get some return on your investment of time. So anything under an hour, you're just going to get confused and bored with it. And I'm sort of like, who's reading a novel for less than an hour at a time? And the students are, where am I going to find an hour where I don't do some, or I'm not multitasking or don't have other responsibilities? And that's a real concern and it's a lifestyle choice and it's, you know, as it is with me. Um, so I've, I, I repeat that story to them and say, this is, you know, this is something one of your peers told me and he's right and, you know, that's... So, am I, am I at time now? I've still got five minutes, great. Ten. Okay, ten! <laughs> Lordy. Okay. Um, so, some of the other things we've done here. Um, as well as valuing reading, thinking about reading as something that is very different to writing. And again, I'm, I'm going back over territory that, that others have mentioned already. One of the exercises that I'm experimenting with in first year is giving them a first task that doesn't require extended writing. So we have a, a poetry questionnaire. Now, this is something that goes back decades to when I was an undergraduate. That, that was my first English university assignment. I'm looking at ways of putting this, turning this into an online uh, tool because I think it, it's one of the few things in my discipline that works in that way. Um, and that is breaking up the different activities of, of analysing a poem by saying, you know, what is it doing? Do some, some you know, scan the metre of the poem, explain these metaphors, how do they work? Uh, what's the effect of the connection between these sounds? look up these words in the Oxford Historical Dictionary and tell me what they meant in the 16th century as distinct from modern day. So things that we would think of as um, absolutely, well, that I would think of in my discipline as absolutely basic to the analysis of literature, that close, careful work that goes down to the words on the page and their organisation on the page, but actually breaking it down for the students and saying, first this, then this, then this, then this. And don't worry about writing an essay. Okay, just give me the answers. Spend some time sitting still with a poem and, um, and using your own responses to it in order to understand what, what that, that author is, uh, is saying. Then at the end of it, we, we might go off and write an essay out of that. But separating the analytical work from the writing work. Most of them have a huge anxiety around writing and I think a lot of that has to do with the, the high pressure HSC experience that they've had. 
they've all been taught to write essays, but what they've been taught in essay writing, in my, from what I can see, is a very rigid model of essay writing. Many of them have been issued with a template. This is what a paragraph in an essay looks like. So one I've seen for year nine English was insert author's name, users. Insert technique to insert effect, okay? And then repeat this four times per paragraph. Um, so I think it's, it's when, when you see a template like that and think that's the model of essay writing, it's not hard to understand why they're struggling with essay writing and uh, why they're feeling that the whole writing experience is something that's being demanded of them <laughs> rather than something that is based in, I've got something I want to say about this poem or this event or, or this topic. Um, so it, it, it loses that, that authenticity. Um, so, focusing on, on the analysis, trying to alleviate that anxiety around essay writing, um, and, and trying to move them away from this, you know, the, the cut and paste mentality. Also, we've gone back to basics in our course design, but, but in the organisation of our particularly first year tutorials, we have a big emphasis on making them read poetry aloud in groups. That's part of their homework, and then they have to come and, and work on it as, as an oral text. I have a colleague who offers students a bonus 5% for memorising 30 lines of Milton and coming up to him somewhere, anywhere, and, and reciting it to him. <laughs> um, because he feels you can't, you can't study Milton without knowing some of it off by heart. And there is a learning by heart thing that is you know, absolutely about, again, giving ownership of that text, of that material to the student, um, and using that as the basis, the starting point for whatever kind of analysis and whatever kind of um, other, uh, other work that they might be doing with it. In, as I said, in our course design, we've gone back to basics. Our two first year English courses look like something from the 1960s. We have introduction to English literary genres where we teach novel, poetry, drama, uh, and then we have a historical period course of, of English literature looking at what happens to text when you, when you put them in, in different groups. And the reason we, we opted for those, those highly traditional categories is A, that was what students didn't have, and B, that was what they were flocking to. In, over the last decade, we noticed, even though we're teaching, we're offering courses in cultural studies, courses in post-colonial literature, courses in critical theory, the big numbers were going to 17th century literature, 18th century literature. They felt that there was a deficit in their cultural literacy, in their sense of the grand narratives of, of Western culture, and some of them at least felt, whether that's because they were going on to be teachers or for their own general humanities um, cultural capital, they wanted to have that, that, kind of, um, that kind of information at their fingertips. So it seemed important to us to respond to that. Uh, in, in a particular way. Um, the other thing that we, we did that we've, we've also heard extensively about um, is the, the class prep notes that we get students to bring along. Uh, we have a cruel but fair method where they have to do it every week and we randomly choose three weeks. They don't know which one's in advance. And I have students begging, you know, please collect the notes. You know, <laughs> please, please collect the notes. Will I, won't I? Um, <laughs> toying with it. But after working through the reading resilience material, I asked them last year, did they want to have the opportunity to do blogs instead of these notes? Did they want the opportunity to do the interaction with each other as part of the preparation of the tutorial? And, and definitely more than half of them said they wanted to keep it as paper notes. Um, they didn't want to do blogging. For some of them, it was a kind of conservative thing. They, did, they didn't like the, the online experience and didn't particularly want to augment that. And others felt um, that they wanted to keep their fun separate from their work. Um, I actually think, though, that the, the blogging thing is really, really useful. I think it's something that we should be encouraging them to do more of rather than the paper notes that, that I'm getting them to hand in. Although that said, and, and I'll make this my last point, um, I did another informal anecdotal um, little test a few years ago when I was teaching a course entirely by myself and as it happened I was marking 
the exam papers from these students at the same time that I was marking their final essay, their major essay. So after I'd, I'd completed the marking, I, I thought, oh, it's too tempting, I'm, you know, I'm going to sit them next to each other and see. And almost all of them wrote better in the exam than they did in the, in the essay. Their writing was, I mean, we were talking about this at, <laughs> over lunch, the writing was more authentic, it's a word I keep coming back to. It was simpler, there were no sophisticated sentences and complex vocabulary, or oh, there was some, but they were writing in a way um, where they had an agency in their writing. That was something that was really clear to me, that they were sitting there in a room with a pen in their hand and a piece of paper in front of them and giving an account of their reading and giving an account of what was they felt to be significant about the material. And that led to better writing. It led to clearer, more effective communication. So um, I'll, I'll end on that point. Thank you. feedback that your analysis of their exam writing? Yes. Yeah, I tell them that when they say, I wish there wasn't an exam, I say, the reason I have an exam is that blah, 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 blah. So it's better for you in terms of your marks. And, and yeah, I, I think there's something, there's something performative about it. It's like a you know, a, a theatrical performance in some way. That's something they're called on to be in the minute and, and give account of themselves in that way. And I think, I think it's quite fascinating um, that writing isn't something that can just be kind of moved across into lots of different categories. Yeah. Regina, I'm sorry, I missed the first few minutes of your talk, so you may have already covered this. To what extent, uh, uh, one of the things you talked about was the students not being able to do with uh, work of teaching are in my naive mind classical approaches to literature and expression and mm. English writing and construction. Yep. Um, and yet these students are uh, conceivably arriving at the university having never used a pen and paper yep. because they're big tablets and all that sort of other technology. So the question is, are there valid ways of them being appropriately critical literature analysts, for instance, that has uh, completely mediated an online view, and in contrast to what I heard you describe as the classical view. I'm sorry, I'm... So could, I, could, they be, could they be able to be excellent poetry analysts, but do that piecemeal electronically? Um, possibly, um, but they're not able to sustain that. So they may be really good at it online, and then are unable to translate the insights. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, I suppose what I'm thinking about is whether, uh, something like poetry, for instance, as you say, has a, there's a deep and historic structure, which I never managed to understand. Um, but I wonder if, as the students become increasingly mediated through uh, instantaneous and okay. many, yeah. many instructions, whether A, poetry structure could change, what's considered to be poetry? Oh, almost certainly it will, and, and in all sorts of good ways. You know, it's not, Are there going to be new ways of going yeah. about the analysis? Great. Yeah. Great. No, that, now I get it. That's a great question. Um, I wouldn't want to think for a minute that it's all a loss, okay? And, and you just need to think that, you know, novel readers in the 19th, early 19th century were seen to be, you know, losing all the skills, trivial, airhead, you know, women usually, of course. Um, you know, so novel, novel reading was seen to be, in some way, a, a come down from, from serious you know, historical reading and so on. Um, and all media changes all other media all the time, and most of that's really good. But I feel a real sadness that my students don't know the pleasure of sitting still with something that is out of their world and unfamiliar, and I want them to have that as well. And that might be a forlorn, crazy kind of hope, and might be a, simply a nostalgic thing. I don't think so. I want to communicate to them that not everything happens in that immediate <laughs> kind of way, um, that there are good things that you can get from sitting still. And their experience with Dickens, say, they still hate Patrick White, you know. <laughs> Although they said, you know, the, the, I, I don't make Patrick White compulsory, but they, they still have to read some and talk about it. They read it on the back of Christina Stead, which was compulsory, and they said, well, I like Patrick White better than Christina Stead. He's, he's better than Christina Stead. So they've got some kind of reference point. But they know something, you know, they've, they've, 
they've, they've had some access to things that are outside um, their immediate taste. I mean, one of the things that is really distinctive about their media consumption, as we all know, is they work in these bubbles, these niche kind of bubbles, and it's really, really easy to find a gazillion other things that are like the things that you've just looked at and liked. You know, you can't go on a site without having those, those kind of things happen. But it's much harder to find something that is utterly unimaginable to you, and, and I want them to have the skills to do that as well, to, to, to leave themselves and, and to encounter something different. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> my name is Disciplinary History and I could multiply your examples. <laughs> I bet. Um, in history. I, I, I won't do that, but I can't just resist one before I get to my question, which is we very recently gave a group of students a sample essay, uh, a model essay, that was on a tutorial question rather than on an essay question, so yep. that we don't you know, then get that back. We gave them that and we had workshops run by the Academic Language and Learning Unit. It was a really successful exercise, except one group was very critical of the essay. We didn't tell them, and we never will, that I wrote it, <laughs> with, the, with, with the aim of it being around the sort of maybe DHD kind of level for a first year essay. And um, one of the students criticised it for not being written academically enough. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. written in academic enough language. And I said, well, what do you mean? He felt that I should be using phrases like, the respondent finds that. Yes. And uh, yeah. I thought, you know, yeah. why would you do that? And also... But then that's a conversation that it is worth having with them. It is a conversation. You know, when would you do that and yeah. when wouldn't you? Exactly. And, you know, like, there, there, there should still be openness rather than prescription. I'm sure you agree with me. Well, we, we had that conversation. It's also very interesting um, on the topic of openness that, that a lot of them said, oh, well, uh, this paragraph's no good because it doesn't do A, B and C. And I said, well, why does that make it no good? Well, we were told you must always do A, B, and C. And then somebody else would pipe up and say, we were told never to do A, B, and C. <laughs> so you get these incredibly rigid tenets. And, 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 and no notion of uh, kind of independence, you know. You make an independent judgment about whether your paragraph requires A, B, and C to be done in it or not, as the content requires, yeah. which is the real point. And that's it. Yeah. That, that's the flexibility. But to go, I mean, to go to my question and, and to sort of talk about something that's analogous to what my colleagues in engineering and science and sciences and so on are concerned about is that the level of preparation that they're observing in students who, for example, the level of pre preparedness for university in mathematics, mm. which is you know, obviously central to yeah. many of the disciplines they teach, is much poorer than in the past, although reporting, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, reporting that at the top end there isn't a problem. But at the, at the time, at the bottom end, yeah. you know, the students who come to university to study mathematics because they've done advanced mathematics very well at, at, at school are, are still fantastic. Problem, yeah. but, but the others are a problem. Do we then, and, and, and we in history have responded in much the same way as you're responding, in a sense, okay, let's, let's, let's go back. Yeah. Let's go back. Sort of unpick some of this, you know, let's read Derrida stuff, which is fine later on, but it's beyond anything you need or can help you at the moment, and you're just going to be like a monkey. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, come back, unpick that, try to scaffold some basic skills in first year. Does that mean, everywhere, that we simply have to accept that what comes out at the end of third year is going to be at a very different level to what was coming out at the end of third year? Yeah, it's good. It's I mean, does, 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 does this change in the input necessarily imply yeah. a change in the output? Or, is, or should we feel some overwhelming responsibility to solve that problem? I would say yes and no. I'd say just as the, good, the, the top students coming in are as good as they ever were, the top students coming out are, are likewise fantastic. And they will have pulled some others up with them um, because we certainly put more group work into third years. We tend to have symposia as, as a final assessment for our third year students, so we give them a lot more um, autonomy um, and they're helping each other you know, in that way. Um, I think. I believe that if we can get them to take charge of that learning, reading and writing process in first year and second year, they can do anything, you know, to, to, to the limit of their kind of interest and ability and, and all of that in third year. So I don't think it necessarily follows. Um, and I mean, thinking about the outputs differently, for me, if I've taught a student to persevere with a hard thing, whether it's a report or a novel or something else, and struggle to articulate what their responses are 
and to communicate those to other people. That's a fantastic outcome. And I don't actually care in the end if our third year students aren't, haven't read as much or, or whatever, if in the process they've, they've got that. And I, I say to my students also, you're not going to read all the novels on this course and you might hate Patrick White now, but in 10 years time you might find the book again and have a look at it and it might start making sense then in a way that it didn't and then that will be you know, a fantastic outcome of this. So I know I'm speaking in kind of you know, humble, domestic kind of ways, it's simply about the pleasure of reading, but that, a whole lot of other things flow on from that for me. So I, I want to hang on to those, those sorts of things. Thank you.